Hello everyone, I'm High Treason and at long last we're going to have a look at the Zenith Super Sport laptop which is not branded as a Zenith, it's branded as the National Telecoms Provider and I think there's quite a few of them if you look out there, they certainly had a sizeable contract with them but it is a Super Sport, you can tell just by looking at it that it's a Zenith, you know, it's, it's solid and everything the manuals and the discs are branded as Zenith uh, at least the ones that came with it. Uh, the other ones that came in the case aren't, and they're kind of novel for what they're branded as. But yeah, it's uh, it's worth having a look, I suppose. It uses the 8088, which I think you will know was the processor in the original IBM PC all the way back in 1981, which seems a long time ago, although this is more of a Turbo XT class laptop in that it runs at a faster clock speed, 8 megahertz. We can turn it down and we will do that at some stage, but yeah, it, it's 8 megahertz by default, so it's a Turbo XT, but I don't know if that will really give us any advantage, because, well, the 286 can probably quite easily walk all over it, and from what I know, the 286 was the single biggest leap from one Intel processor to another. At least on this architecture, assuming you would call it an x86, you might call it an x88, I don't know. It's a little bit strange to think about. But anyway, we're not going to get very far, just stood here rambling at a camcorder all day. So I guess we'll actually have a look at this damn thing and see what we make of it. So this is the Zenith Super Sport or Super Sport. I'll just pronounce it Super Sport because it's how I've always said it. And this is going to go a lot smoother if I just keep doing that, even if it's wrong. It's an 8088 model, although there were 286 and 386SX models available with varying features. The first thing you will probably spot is the lack of Zenith logo. In fact, this one is British Telecom branded. And they are the National Telecommunications Company in England and, well, in fact, most of the United Kingdom. So, yeah, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. I, I think just regular old Ireland use a uh, com or something. Yeah, uh, not sure on that. You may remember when we looked at the Slim Sport laptop some time ago, and there's definite similarities with this one. I would imagine it's designed by the same people. The, the Super Sport model came two years earlier in 1987, so this is an older laptop. It uses the same power cube, as Zenith like to call them, though this also got BT branding. Can't so I understand what they mean by 47.63 hertz. I mean, the UK runs on 50, other places run on 60. Uh, no idea. Absolutely no idea. Couldn't tell you. Switch mode supply though, because it, it makes uh, an interesting noise. So yeah, it's not a, a linear transformer, which some of them were still at this point. The manual is similarly detailed, and that is Zenith branded. It, it has that quality that seems to follow these old Zenith devices around. I mean, it goes overboard. I could sit and talk about this manual alone all day. It tells you everything you need to know to start working with this laptop, but it goes into some real technical detail. We've got pinouts not only for the sockets on the back, but for chips inside the laptop, and hey, we might want to program some video registers, or, you know, I'm, I'm actually reasonably confident we could build an exact replica of this laptop just by following this manual. This is absolutely insane. Imagine if you had this now. Like, that's absolutely... Why go to this level? But then, hey, I, I'm not going to complain. I think this is absolutely brilliant. There is a battery, so this is a proper laptop. Maybe mm, hesitant to test it because, well... It, it wasn't used for years before I got it, and batteries do scare me a little bit. Probably would work, though. Uh, the one on the Slim Sport still does. Nonetheless, we should talk about it, because you might notice how it attaches to the back of the laptop. Again, the basic chassis of this laptop is more modern than quite a few of the other ones out of its time. 
But once you stuff the battery on, you get that old timey bulge on its ass end there. It, it's got a big arse when the battery's on. Now, when you look at the battery itself, you can see how it's held on by these metal clips. Those are metal. They're extremely thick. I don't think you're going to be pulling that battery off by accident, let's put it this way. Well, I've heard that some variations of it have more of the clip holes in the back end of the battery, so you can stack more than one battery on top of each other. But this is not something I've seen, it's just something I've heard a few times over the years, and, well, there is one particular variant of this laptop that, if any of them were to have this feature, I would expect it to be that one, and I, I guess we'll make a note of it when we get there, but this is unconfirmed, so we'll just assume it doesn't do this, uh, because I just don't know. Still, Zenith were chosen uh, for a huge order from none other than the US military. In fact, you'll find Zenith machines were all over the place. They were all over the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, and other services in the United States. I think even the IRS used these things. The contracts spanned over several years with different systems, but the Army and Navy, at least, I know used the Super Sport. Now, if any of them had stackable batteries, I would think it would be those ones. And this is inside the battery pack. Uh, that is the charging circuit right there. It's a very simple charging circuit, and we'll get to why it's very simple in a minute, but that should mean we could just charge this without having it plugged in the laptop, which would be useful in its military applications, I guess, because you'd be able to have batteries charging and use the laptop somewhere else if you had a spare power cube or extra batteries. But yeah, these are the cells. You can see they're about c size cells. Zenith has their logo on here as well. Standard warnings. They're made in Japan. I guess that would be the part number. And they actually look to be in good shape. I'd imagine these are NICAD cells. I don't think they'd be lithium polymer, otherwise I wouldn't be in here. And Well, I've never seen a LiPo cell that big uh, in real life. I mean, that's not so... They, they must exist, but I've, I've never run into one yet. I don't know if they'd hold the charge, but I'm not actually that weary of attempting to charge them, I don't think. I might have to do that. I'll probably do it outside my shed, because if a cell's gone short, I suppose it could explode or something. It's quite toxic nickel cadmium, but doesn't really happen that much, because nickel cadmium batteries are extremely stable and they're extremely reliable. They're actually illegal in the United Kingdom now. You can't purchase them anymore unless they're for medical equipment, which to me says a lot. If they're going to use these in medical equipment, they must be fucking good. And they can take a, a lot of abuse, NICAD batteries, without anything going wrong. They're extremely stable. They require very, very simple circuitry to charge them. They don't require all this complicated crap that everything's have. Just a little bit of voltage regulation, and you're pretty much good to go. These are 30-year-old cells now. Uh, and if just one cell's gone duff, we're going to have some kind of problems that we will notice, but I don't think anything too bad will happen. Uh, yeah, I can't see any sign that they've leaked. It looks like there's components in there as well, and I, I'm sort of wondering if maybe those are... Maybe there's thermo thermistors in there, thermal diodes or something, or... I don't know, maybe it's just to figure out how much power's there. You'd think they'd measure the voltage, but... Perhaps not. We might give it a go, we might not. I'll report back at the end. Uh, no leakage whatsoever. But it is a zenith though, I mean I guess I'm too used to Toshiba where they'll leak at the slightest provocation. They have a very interesting smell, whereas there's no smell lingering about this thing, which, like I say, to me suggests those batteries still have their lovely poisonous juices inside them. Of course, in the UK, uh, BT used these laptops, as we very well know, as that's where mine's from. Oh, the, the battery is shaped so you can still use the ports on the back, just as long as the door's open. Although it does block the CRT connector and the external bus. Although I suppose if you were using a battery, well, you probably wouldn't have a CRT to hand. Because if you had a CRT, that implies you've got an electrical outlet there, and so you wouldn't be using the battery, you would think. I don't know, uh, and certainly whilst those external bus boxes have their own supply of power, they are going to drain from the battery quite extensively, I would think, and again, they need an electrical outlet, so it doesn't seem like that much of a problem, I, I don't think this was really that much of an issue. You've got to fit the battery somewhere. 
Now, the ports aren't really interesting, but they are just the basics. You have, obviously, that CGI output that the battery blocks. A serial port. Yeah, we'd be able to control the VCR with this. A parallel port and one for an external floppy drive, which seems redundant on my model, but I imagine it probably would still work. Over on the right-hand side, if you were looking from the front, is the power switch recess, so you can't slide it by accident, which is always a plus, and a 3.5-inch 720k floppy drive. This is drive A. That curve above it shouldn't be there, but this thing's like 30 years old, which is quite an age for a machine like this, so... Uh, yeah, she's starting to go a bit saggy and wrinkly now. That's just what happens. It's still good. There's a keypad input. I haven't tried it. I don't know if the pinout's the same as a regular keyboard, but I do know that there are models later that use the smaller port. Uh, we could check the pinout in the manual, but yeah, it, it was designed for a specific keypad add-on that you could order from Zenith. The front has nothing other than that handle, really. I'll be honest, I, I don't trust it so much now. This, the old plastic, it's going a little bit brittle, I would imagine. It seems to be okay, but I wouldn't carry it around on this all day. Still, why the hell did they stop doing this? I'd love a handle like this on my Elite Book. So many times I have wanted to move the damn thing. I've had both hands full. It would save me a second journey to the car if it had this damn handle on it. Why did they stop doing it? I know it's cost, but... Damn, I like this idea, man. It was good. The thing with the weight is I can find various things on the internet. It seems to vary between 10 and 18 pounds, which is quite a range, whereas apparently my Elite Book only weighs about 7 to 8 pounds. But it's definitely heavier, so... Either this Super Sport is missing something, the specifications are wrong somewhere, or... My Elite Book's gained weight somehow, which, well, there's dirt there, but I don't imagine it'd be that heavy. And the battery's not in, and it's definitely, I just don't know. Uh, something's not adding up here, and <laughs> I'm not really sure where to search. I don't have any scales capable of measuring things of this weight, so we're just going to have to leave it to guesswork. Who knows? Underneath, there's not really much of anything, which figures, I mean, what are you going to do under there? Rubber feet are still good. The ones on my Elite Book are all stretched and saggy and fell off, so those are gone. The ones on my Dell were becoming liquefied, but I don't have that to hand right now. BT also have their name on the label. Interesting, you can see this one has the middle cut out where the serial number is. There's probably a regular Zenith label underneath these. They're on a metal plate like the Slim Sport was, so yeah, they've probably just stuffed these over the regular labels. Interest now there's still an FCC classification though. Apparently the laptop was made in Japan too. Uh, Zenith chose a good place to make it then, because Japan has a good reputation for electronics. Uh, they're very good at it compared to a lot of other countries. Uh, I do think South Korea could give them a run for their money today, and even a few places in Taiwan. But still, that's definitely a good omen if it says made in Japan on it. That's, that's usually a good sign. Hmm, British Standards Compliance, well, you don't see that anymore. Odd that it has an FCC declaration too. I, I don't think those apply in the United Kingdom. You'd think BT would have had it taken off, but... Yeah, they, they don't seem to have tampered with that label as much. Uh, I don't know, whatever. It, it's FCC declaration. It's doing no harm by bin there, right? There's a door here. You can lift it with something flat. Screwdriver will do. Under that is a dip switch, which lets you change a few settings, namely some video stuff and CPU clock. It's kind of doing the job of the dip switches on old motherboards and stuff in, in your regular Tarbo XT. It's, it's very similar. Also, you're not misreading that socket. That is for an 8087 floating point unit, so you can stuff one of those in if you want to dick around in databases and large spreadsheets a lot, or... God forbid, maybe you could actually do CAD on this thing. I, I'm not really a fan of that idea, but you could try. I, I would imagine it would run. I mean, I don't want to do this stuff, but if I find an FPU going cheap, or if somebody just throws one at me, I, I'll install it anyway, because empty sockets suck. But yeah, that would have a, a impact on battery life, I would imagine. I don't know how much, but it will certainly use more power. The thing is, don't be disappointed by this chassis bin plastic. That is some pretty fucking thick plastic, like, uh... Oh, let me have a look. I've got a floppy disk here. We'll, uh, put 
put it next to one of the floppy disks. And yeah, it's actually slightly thicker than a floppy disk by just a hair's, hair's thickness, I think. So, yeah, you know, they weren't messing about with this. So it's, it's well built, even if it is only a plastic chassis. You know, it's, it's a solid plastic chassis. Now this screen mechanism is lovely, I mean look at that, there's a whole lot going on there with these little bits and pieces locking and unlocking in there at different times in the process of opening it. You wouldn't see something like that anymore and I'm sure that's not really a bad thing, it is a bit needless but I, I like it. It's, it's so complex for such a simple task. As seems to be the usual for Zenith laptops, it has a big screen with adjustments right on the front where you want them. A lot of laptops still had little dinky screens, some of them weren't even backlit yet, so yeah, this thing's pretty good. It's an impressive size. Of course, the screen backlight is a cathode bulb, it's not using LEDs. However, we're not completely devoid of LEDs, there are some here for floppy drives and low battery warnings, but that's it, there's not really anything else. Speaking of indicators, what the hell is this sticker talking about? I have no idea. The, the keyboard layout is a bit weird and it feels odd to type on for some reason. I like the mechanism though. I don't, I don't know how it works and I can't get the keycaps off. I, at least I'd have to pry them hard and I'm kind of weary of doing that because it feels like it's going to break something. But whatever is under there, it feels good. I'd like a full size one of these actually. I, I have one that feels similar to this one. If you know what these are called, do let me know. It doesn't feel like the painful buckling springs, but it's a bit too heavy to be regular rubber dome. So yeah, I really don't know. It, it It's different to the one on the T3200SX as well, although that's quite a nice mechanism as, as well. I, I'm not sure. I also do like how the LEDs are placed under the lock keys instead of above the keyboard. That's kind of cool. My Elite Book does that. Yeah, it's dirty. It gets daily use. Who cares? You don't have to type on it, do you? Now, you know, I'm bashing on that keyboard, but the thing is, I might be missing something entirely. In that when you look at it, it actually resembles a typewriter a lot more than a PC keyboard. It might not have been as stupid as you think to build it that way. I mean, computers weren't that widespread in 1987. They were around, but they weren't as common, so yeah, average Joe was probably more used to using a typewriter. I don't know that it was necessarily a good idea, but at least there might be some reasoning behind it. It may not be as stupid as it first appears to be. And it's certainly not awful anyway, it just takes a bit of getting used to. I tell you what, these screen hooks are just plain nasty. I mean, they're metal, and they're sharp enough to draw blood at their points. Interesting, all those locking pieces seem to prevent them being moved when the screen is raised. Still beats the mechanism on the T1200 anyway. Supposedly the reason for them locking, and it's done by gravity, is to prevent the screen coming open if the laptop's being carried by its handle. So as usual, Zenith thinks of everything. It, it does indeed seem impossible to move the screen latches when the laptop is in an upright position. That is absolutely brilliant. I don't think any laptops today really work that way. The Elite Book sure as hell doesn't. I've had the monitor come open on that and nearly dropped it before. Especially as it's kind of difficult to carry because it has no freaking handle on it. Internally, I can't show you too much as the plastic is old and brittle and cracks are appearing. So I'd rather not risk wedging the boards out if I could at all help it. Ah, uh, excuse me, Mr. Script Reader. That is a bloody pussy's way out. Uh, well, you know that guy's probably right. Still, there are floppies. I'm not sure they're standard drives because I've not got anything else to work in here. And they are a little bit intermittent at times. I think that might just be the cables though. You could get hard drives in these, but I cannot figure out where it would go. Presumably where the left hand floppy drive is. But I don't know where the cables would go. It must have been a proprietary drive because there's no standard hard drive connectors, at least types that I know of, available on this board. There are a bunch of unused 34-pin headers on here though. There are five 34-pin headers in total, so I assume one or two are for hard drives, but who knows what the rest of them are supposed to do. It seems most of the chips and such are on the bottom of the board, so it's a bit difficult to show you, but I am going to do it. 
it, it is a double-sided load on this board, and that would have cost a hell of a lot to produce in 1987. It seems to be very, very good quality, though. I, they didn't skimp on it. Also, it's a very small thing, but this ribbon has a blue pin 1 marker on. I've never seen that before. I've seen red, I've seen green, I've seen white, I've seen black. Well, now I've seen blue. I, it's usually Mitsumi who use the green ones, but... Yeah, I'm not sure if one of these cables is original or not, because they're both different. It's really weird. I don't know what the hell that's about. I can't help but feel maybe this thing did have a hard drive in here at some point. Now, I speculate that these two 34 pin headers up here aren't for hard drives, but those might actually be for the external bus. Because, well, when you put them both together, you'd have 68 pins, and we know Zenith's external bus connector has 68 pins on it. So, maybe that's what it does. I don't know what the one at the front does for. That's a total mystery. The floppies use one each. Now, at the front left, there's a modem. Uh, at least a space for one. BT didn't put one in, though. So, yeah, fuck them. Right next to it actually looks like there's a space for a battery. So, yeah, as in a... CMOS or clock battery to go in there, which they did make these with the 286. I think they were more advanced than this one, so well, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a model that used the battery. And well, why make its own chassis? I'm not sure why there's a screw hole right in the center of the shot there. Maybe something screwed in there, but well, I just don't know, and I don't have a model that does that to really compare it against. And this space here is clearly for a memory expansion, which Looks very similar to the interface in the Slims port. I can't help but wonder if they use the exact same memory expansion. Which wouldn't surprise me. Again, you know, the the bus on these two processors wouldn't be that different. I don't really see any need to redesign something like that, so they probably just didn't bother. Now if we take the motherboard out, which is very difficult, because you've got to put a screwdriver through a heatsink on the back of the power supply and... It's just a nightmare. This thing does have screws missing. Somebody has been in here before me. And, well, we can get the motherboard out. And turning it over, yeah, you can see there's actually not that much going on. It's just an 8088 in a box. There's a bunch of RAM on one side. It has not really a hell of a lot. And, well, yeah, we've got a video controller in there somewhere. We've got the legitimate Intel 8088, the 8 megahertz version, and we'll have keyboard controllers and stuff like that, and obviously floppy disk controllers. It's really, really quite straightforward. In fact, I would imagine it'd be repairable, <laughs> because everything in here is so huge. Uh, I like this one capacitor up on its legs here with insulation around them, just to fit it in, because well, low-profile ones probably cost a lot of money, so yeah, they would have saved some cash here without skimping on quality still. Although there is a big low-profile one next to it. Look at that. That's that's pretty. You don't really see those around now. Yeah, there's there's some real interesting means of building this thing going on in here. I, I can't go into too much detail because I think it would get boring, but I'm just kind of talking this bit just so I can show you some more shots of this board. Uh... Yeah, it, you know, obviously you can look up individual chips in there, but it seems Zenith have their name on some of them. I I don't think Zenith could fab their own chips, so I'd imagine they've just paid to have their logo put on someone else's stuff. There's a lot of Mitsubishi in here. Uh, Mitsubishi, well, they're Japanese, so yeah, probably good electronics in here. I, I don't think we're going to have any real problems anytime soon. This thing seems quite solid. That Yamaha there has a very high pin density for 1987, though. That is absolutely crazy. Of course, now that's child's play, but yeah, at the time, this wasn't really that commonplace. Now, this video is late because I wanted to get a converter to record the video output directly. All that waiting, and I can't do it because the converter board doesn't work with this laptop's CGA signals. Uh, I don't know whatever. I mean, it's supposed to, but it's a cheap device, and I still have use for it. But yeah, it's not, not any use for this video. It, I'm sort of suspicious of the CGA port on this laptop. Maybe doesn't work properly, but I haven't seen the T1200 since I moved here, and that's the only other CGA device I had. So... 
yeah, unfortunately, I don't think I can really confirm this. Uh, sucks. So, yeah, whether it's the converter or the laptop at fault, I don't know. Because some people have this problem with these converters with devices at work. But I've noticed some oddities with the laptop's output. So I just, I don't know. I, I can't be certain. Shit happens. But, of course, this means we are going to be filming off the screen like it's 2006. As there's no composite to fall back on. But we're not missing much. CGA is ugly anyway. So, well, what do we do here? Start the machine, of course. It runs Zenith DOS. It's just MS-DOS 3. It does DOS 3 stuff. It has a mode motor command if you've got hard drives. So you can have them spin down after a certain amount of time to save electricity. Which seems good to me. I'm not using that because I don't have a hard drive. But yeah, we know what DOS does. I, I, I would think. So, I won't go into that. Obviously, it's less capable than later versions of DOS. Although, yeah, you probably could start a later version of DOS if you wanted to. Just not much point on a machine like this. The laptop came with this briefcase full of strange disks. I really don't know. Odd stuff. A letter to the engineer who owned the laptop suggests they use Crosstalk a lot. Which is an old terminal emulation software. There are a lot of things in these discs that I probably shouldn't really be looking at. But I would imagine this stuff is really quite useless by now. Funny though, to think I have this thing, and I'm in the one city that doesn't have BT in the UK. Yeah, we have KCOM here, and well, that's it. KCOM or fuck off, basically, unless you want to go fully wireless. What a lovely install they've done in my living room. You know that worked until their engineer showed up. Yeah, we have white telephone boxes too. Yeah, and you know full well, I will do a video about Kirkcom someday, but that won't be today, I mean, it's Sunday morning, it reeks in here, I've stood on about 20 needles already to get here, and members of the public keep calling me a ponce. What a pile of shit. Anyway, this gives us some insight into what was going on. I'm guessing this was an engineer's laptop, and he probably used it to dick around with exchanges and stuff. And maybe we'll never know. I can't start some of the software, because it wants a modem on COM1, and it doesn't play ball with the external modem I have. And I don't hook it up to a telephone line either, because I've no idea what the hell it might start dialing out to. Probably nothing, but... Yeah, I'd, I'd rather not piss off my telecoms provider, because it's not like I can just go to another one. And I think they already don't like me. To be honest, we do run into a problem here. And I genuinely find machines in this class quite boring. I mean, it's a laptop, so it's docking points already. And there's not a lot to do with an 8088, is there? The games were shit. The applications were slow and cumbersome. These things don't have much place in the world now. And they've aged horribly. This thing is really, really boring. But, hey, it might be one of its best strengths, because it implies the machine isn't doing anything wrong. It's definitely a Turbo XT that you can carry around. It does everything a Turbo XT would do. It seems to do it as well as any real Turbo XT. So, yeah, I can't really floor it. Of course, the downside is being a laptop is the lack of expansion, and I don't know how the hell that external bus would wire up to it. We could probably figure it out, though. But even then, I, I'm not sure of the practicality of this. Now, the screen is quite slow. It's a passive matrix, though it is good for its time. And it seems to be holding up well in its old age. It's still working. It's an STN screen of some kind. Uh, twisted pneumatic. Yeah, I don't know. All slow technology, you know, they... I wouldn't really put these on laptops now. Still, it seems quite a few of these screens have died, so yeah, this thing's just kicking ass, because it looks like it just left the factory. Uh, the screen's picture, at least. I don't know that failures and such are common on Zenith laptops anyway. They seem to last really well overall. At least in my experience, they, they just seem to be tough, well made. It is a blue and white screen, though. It's not black and white like the Slim Sport. Notice again how the colours are inverted to save power. Yeah, white is cheaper than blue. 
by default the gates let the white light through and must be powered to display blue pixels at least i think that's why they used to do it this way uh, maybe it's just easier to see or something but disconnecting signals on these old stn screens always yielded the screen turning white so yeah i figure it's just cheaper on power to show the screen this way when most of it's going to be white so most of your pixels are off yeah uh, that's what i always figured cgi applications do work as does anything else that should run on a turbo xt there'll be something that doesn't i'm sure but most of them were still text-based at the time you'd not likely run into problems that quickly then we can run graphics crazy cars looks impressive i suppose it's not bad it works the music's awful though <laughs> But that is just a PC speaker. We don't have a sound card in here. You just have the, the beeper speaker. That's that's it. Your programmable interval beeper thing. Yeah, not really that great, but well, it's all you really need on a machine like this. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's kind of funny how the previous owner, that BT engineer, has an unlabeled disc in his collection, which has a games directory with some Space Invaders knockoff on it which is horribly unfair. I can't beat this game worth hell. But, well, yeah, you can play it on here. Unfortunately, I, I just, I don't know, I, I feel there's nothing you can do on machines like this that you can't do on a later one better. I mean, even word processing is something people will always fall back on, but running a WYSIWYG editor on here probably isn't going to happen. If there are any, they're going to be slow and ugly and probably use some weird format and well converting formats is a, a horrible bit of sorcery with word processing you'll always lose some layout information or something it's like my book trying to get it to pdf but it screws up my layout and everything it's just irritating that was written in word 97 by the way but yeah we won't be running that on here so you have to run a non WYSIWYG word editor it, imagine basically trying to write a formatted word document but in notepad is kind of what it would look like it'd just not be a fun time and of course we'd be stuck getting it off with floppy disks or serial link cables now it's like the slim sport this does have a monitor in rom if you press ctrl or insert you can actually start perking things around in memory and disassembling things and run some tests very useful uh, it, it doesn't really do anything that spectacular to look at, but it is there, and like I say, it is useful if you want to do some diagnostics on discs or something, or have a look at what's going on in memory, but you better know what you're doing if you're going to look in there. It's, it's very complicated stuff, obviously, because uh, we're well, basically just looking directly what's going on there. There's, it's not really human readable. Uh, only benchmark we're really going to run on here is top bench, and um, well, yeah, it runs, it seems to score pretty much on par with the real XT, or at least, yeah, it, it trades places back and forth. There seems a far bit of variation. Now, if we turn the speed down to 4.77 megahertz, we do indeed get 100% IBM 5150 compatibility, which is what that switch is meant for, you know, it's you know timing specific applications that just relied on the cpu clock supposedly that's like uh four thirds of the ntsc color burst or something the the cpu frequency i would imagine that's part of the reason they chose 4.77 back in 1981 or whatever but yeah it's uh it should therefore be pretty much compatible there's a couple of points either way from one machine to the next but yeah it seems about spot on uh, you don't really see much advantage going up to 8 megahertz. I don't think that's necessarily anything to do with the laptop. I, I would imagine the 
The 8088 just doesn't benefit from a clock increase. The 286 will walk all over it at the same frequency, and well, we know the 286 pretty much doubled the performance now enough. I think it was the largest singular leap from one Intel chip to the next in x86. Assuming you're going to call it x86 and not x88, that's a little bit... Yeah, I have to think about that. Also worth noting that we do get a slight improvement using a CRT. If we press the CRT button and send signals to our non-existent external display, it ticks slightly faster. You could even hear that. Although there is something I should point out, is that if I do this... It gets a little bit faster when you're using a CRT, which we don't have. So yeah, using the LCD actually does slow the machine down in some way. It's a little bit weird, but yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I imagine it must be relying on the CPU or something, or maybe it changes some timing on the video controller. I, I don't know. We'd be here a while if we looked into it, but either way, that it does something. There is an effect on the system. Now, I imagine this is going to be a total blur fest, but let's watch 8088 miles an hour while we finish up here. Now, to run this, I have the dip switch in D turbo mode. We get a real 4.77 MHz operation going, but unfortunately, we can't see things in colour without a CGA monitor or an adapter, which, as we know, I don't have one working, because it does not seem to like this laptop's output. So, yeah, we've got a point on the screen still. From what can be seen here, there don't seem to be any real problems. Outside of the screen does dislike some of the modes the demo tries to display, but uh, they are like non-standard modes, I would think. So, well, I, I'm not sure we can really blame the, the screen, the display panel there for being that way. When these happen, it does actually slow the demo down. You can actually hear the music get slower, like painfully slow. It doesn't crash though, and it doesn't seem to be as prone to this. Or, you know, I, I, I think the, the laptop itself can run it, and it's just the, the video system there with this screen that doesn't like it. Because like I said, we're not crashing or anything, so who knows? Maybe we'll have to look deeper into this in future. I don't suppose, really, that there is much else to say anyway. So I'll leave you with the demo and hang you back to that ugly camera guy once it's over. Assuming we didn't forget something. We didn't forget anything, right? But nonetheless, this thing definitely still works three decades later, which is impressive in its own right. Right, so there we go. There's that. We've had a look. And I do like it, don't get me wrong, but what can you do with this thing? You know, there's... I just... That's the thing with these kind of machines, the, the 8088 stuff, I don't... I don't really get it. Like, there's some people where that's the bulk of their collection. They must find something to do with them, but I'm just... 
stumped as to what you can do with it, aside from some really boring business work that you could do better with a newer machine, almost certainly. It's like the, the games, uh, there's not that many, and they're pretty crap. And it's not just because I'm running on an LCD, you know, it's... If I were, there were anything that good, I, I would be more bored about getting it to work on a CRT. You know, I'd actually invest in the tools to make some circuitry to do it or something. But it, there's just nothing that I can't run better on a newer machine. And none of it's really that much worth running. You know, you get like word processing is always an argument. Well, this you can do, but you can't really. That's the, like you can do it. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you really need more power to run a good word processor like you know the word processors on there they're not WYSIWYG editors at least the ones I've seen they're all text mode and it's just ugly it's more work than it needs to be you know it's not fun it's, it's we might be able to run a WYSIWYG one but with like an 8088 and CGA it's not really gonna look that good um, I don't imagine it's going to work that well, you know, it's, it's going to be slow, it's going to be sluggish, it's probably going to puke out some format I can't read on anything else, or at least I need converters, and conversion of Word documents is not the most reliable thing in the world, you know, I've had problems with the, my book, you know, trying to get the layout consistent, converting it from Word format, because I'd like to stuff it in PDF or something, and... Um, yeah, just trying to get the layout to remain consistent is damn near impossible, and I imagine we'd run into problems like that, so even word processing, I think, is is very limited on these. It's not really... they just haven't aged well, and it's a bit of a shame, because like I say, it is a good machine, it's a good laptop, it's brilliant, and the fact it still works alone makes it pretty impressive to me. It's like 30, it's about 30 years old now. It was 29, I think, because it was made in 88 from the dates on the chips. But, you know, it's got this far. But what can you do with it, you know? Uh, it, it, being a laptop, I think, makes it worse because we can't put Ethernet in there, so we, we can't really do anything that novel with it, which is a bit of a shame. But, yeah, well, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't really have much else to say on it. Um, I'm sorry we had to film off the screen, but as we just established, you're not missing that much. Uh, yeah, there's just not really anything I can do about that. And, yeah, otherwise, obviously, you know, for well, uh, I'm always reading comments, if I'm not always that quick to respond to them. I will get there. I am hanging out on that Discord channel that I, I have, and uh, my boards are there and everything. And... What else is there? Well, yeah, the battery. All right, fine. Look, I know you're going to call me a coward if I don't try this battery out. And I agree, and I'm no coward. I, I get electric shocks every time I touch anything metal in this corner of this room. So I'm not going to shy away from a potential fire or explosion. However, my house is highly flammable, so I'm not doing it in here. I decided to take it out to my workshop. So... Yeah, we've hooked everything up. I've opted to have the laptop switched on, and there's a reason for it. You can charge it outside the laptop, and I want it hooked up, and I want the laptop on for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it could drop the current to the battery just a little bit. It shouldn't, because I think the circuitry is meant to regulate it anyway, but assuming that might have failed, well, it'll lessen the impact of things hitting the cells, so we might be able to slow down anything going run away just a little bit. Or if it's gone short, the laptop won't start up, so then we're not inadvertently leaving the power brick on short circuit for, like, hours on end. Because I don't know if it has short protection, how good it is, and you just don't really want to do that. It's not a good omen, especially as I'm leaving it unattended for pretty long periods of time, which I generally wouldn't do, but... Yeah, it seems safe enough. I mean, there's a water supply just to the left of it, right? We could put a fire out. I uh, left the camera out there, because if it blows up, we want to see it. People like explosions, so... I'd be upset, but if it's going to blow up, we want to see it, don't we? However, it didn't blow up, so... Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, a thing. I'm quite impressed it didn't explode. And I left it for about eight and a half hours, I think, in the end. The manual recommends eight hours, but it would have been over-discharged... I think it's been over a decade since it has been charged, so that will probably isn't a full charge, but I was on limited time. It seems good enough. Uh, 
the battery wasn't even warm to the touch, really. The cells were freezing cold, which to me suggests none of them had gone in reverse. You can get reverse charging if one of them had discharged unevenly somewhere in the past. You can get it with uh, older battery packs as the cells start failing. Uh, the regulators, they got a little bit warm towards the end, but it was just slightly above ambient temperature to the touch, and it was very cold out there. It was cold enough to slow the screen down. Uh, LCDs are a bit temperature sensitive, and yeah, you could actually see it slowing the, the display panel down. It was that cold, which seemed good for charging batteries, uh, just to cool them down a little bit, make sure that nothing's going to like bake in the, the, the heat. And So we brought it in, and it's holding power. Uh, thus far, it's just gone 8 o'clock at night, so, well that's uh, good in itself, I mean, I don't know that it's going to hold this charge for long, but it's holding some amount of charge, and well, there's something to be said for that, you know, it could have just died within a few seconds, and it's not doing that, so, well, about an hour later, we've gone to check on it, and I haven't run the backlight much, the backlight's going to use a lot, there's no hard drive in there, but... I think the floppy motors might always be running in this one, I'm not sure. Uh, we had to boot from the left floppy drive using the internal monitor because the right floppy drive is very intermittent now and the left one's starting to get there. Now I said I, these might be pr proprietary, I can't get any other drives to work in there. Might be some weird jumpering on the drives that I'm not really aware of, I'll have to look into it. Uh, I'd appreciate if somebody could tell me how the hard drives are connected in these. I, I imagine it is proprietary so I probably can't do anything but it, it's this. I'm glad I got the video done when I did because if them drives go out and I can't replace them then well this thing isn't going to have long left which is a shame because it actually works fine otherwise. But needless to say it is still running an hour later with minimal backlight use however over the next hour I use the backlight a little bit more and uh, well yeah, the clock's an hour later, and it's still going. <laughs> it's not dead yet, so basically now I just keep pummeling the backlight. I want it to run the battery out. I'm running out of time to be awake. I need to go to sleep, so I need this thing to run out, and I haven't expected it to get this far. I mean, that's not the larger battery. They made a 4 ampere version. Mine's the 2.2. That's the smaller cell. Um, well, basically, by the time it started doing anything, what do you think? Do you think we're going to make it another hour? Do you think we're going to make it another half hour? Do you think we're going to make it another 15 minutes? I mean, there can't be much juice left in there, surely. Uh, so, yeah, by about 11.30, that is uh, three and a half hours later, the battery finally decides that it's had enough, and the little low energy indicator comes on, the buzzer sounds, and the laptop warns us that it's dying, that it's running out of power. But three and a half hours on a 30 year old battery pack, that is not what I expected to happen at all. That has hugely increased my respect for this thing. You've done over three hours on a 30 year old battery. It's not even the big model, it's a 2.2 amp hour. Now I know we weren't ragging the laptop the whole time. You get a little bit of warmth now, but <laughs> fuck. <laughs> That battery's 30 years old, well, it's 29, but it's close enough. I mean, unless they may have swapped it, maybe 30. You never know the manufacturer did it. It's close enough. <laughs> it's been uh, well more than a quarter of a century, it's still going. Now, we could have left it a bit longer, but the driver for the backlight's whistling a lot, and I don't think it'll damage it, but it was dimming out, and when the voltage is dropping, you draw a lot more current to keep things running, and I don't really want to pull it that hard on its first outing, so we got it as close to fully discharged as I, I dared go, and we'll charge it up again. Oh! Can you hear the screen driver whistling? Massive drop off. Yeah, I don't want to stress things too hard, so we'll turn it off. But that is one hard battery pack. Uh, I'm, I'm honestly amazed it got that far. I feel much you can say I'm absolutely speechless because I don't know what to say. Uh, very impressive. I, I did not think it would get there whatsoever, but yeah, we, we have got there somehow. Uh, I don't know how that low energy light works because there's no communication between the laptop and the battery. I imagine it just measures the voltage or the current. 
the sock tree to run iCADs and to run things off them is very very simple you don't need any fancy waveforms or anything like that they just kind of work. I really liked NICAD batteries, they're very simple, they're very stable, they're very strong they have some really good discharge characteristics uh, you know especially the voltage curve and everything I, I quite like them. They're big and heavy, the energy density on them is not as good as like uh, Nimer is now or Liper but yeah I really liked NICAD batteries, they're, they're resilient little fuckers, I think this is a testament to that. Now I have seen other cells like in Toshiba's, they, they tend to be more prone to leaking so I, again I don't know what the hell Zenith actually make their cells out of or made their cells out of but it seems to work. Uh, I don't know if we're going to find another battery pack that does this at any rate but I can tell you if I needed an order of laptops in 1987 uh, yeah, I think my money would be on this one. <laughs> I can see why it was popular. Like, it's, uh, it's pretty fucking solid, really, isn't it? I, w I actually wanted to make maybe a barrel adapter for that battery, because it's just a standard barrel connector. I use it to power some other stuff, because it seems like it wants to work. Not, a, not the slightest bit of heat coming off of it by the time it was done, either. It just breezed this. Like, it doesn't care. So, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if we can get it to 50, because that is, uh, that is impressive, uh, I can't lie, that has increased my respect for this laptop immensely, but I don't think there's really anything else left to do with it now, uh, so, yeah, uh, I tested the battery, I said I would, and I have, and it is a battery, and it works, I think it works better than when it was fast built. Like, I don't know what the hell they did in there, but it, it definitely seems to work. So, uh, anyway, I'm High Treason. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again next time around. Uh, not sure what we'll do next. Hopefully not as difficult to produce as this bloody thing. Uh, this wasn't even difficult. It's just shit gets in the way. That's just uh, real life, I suppose. You have to live with it. It's not the end of the world. Uh, yeah. I'll see you around. I'm, I think I had something else to say. If I've forgotten, I'll just write in the description. So you just check down there if you wonder. If not, just don't bother. <laughs> it makes no odds to me. Uh, you know. So yeah. I'll see you around. <laughs>